Hey there visual economic viewers, at the time of uploading this video, more than a year and a half had passed since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. From the first moment of the Russian invasion, we have witnessed how Kyiv resisted the Russian attack, and we have seen how the Ukrainian troops have managed to recover a good part of the occupied territory. However, the Ukrainian advance is bringing blood, sweat, and tears, as Winston Churchill would say. Entrenched in the south and the east of the country, Russia is resisting, and Ukraine advances again and again to gradually push back the Russian troops. In all this, the the role of the West is key in this war. The Ukrainian army relies heavily on donated weaponry such as HIMARS rocket launchers, Leopard tanks, Bradley infantry vehicles, and many other pieces of equipment, as well as, naturally, lots and lots of ammunition. Of course, Western countries have not only supported Ukraine by sending arms, ammunition, logistical and financial support, but have also approved a historic package of sanctions against Russia. All this with two objectives in mind. First, weaken Mother Russia and give strength to Ukraine until the final push. Second, to limit Russia's economic and military capabilities in the long run. We've talked about these at length, both on visual politic and here on visual economic. Even so, at this stage of the war, one thing is clear. The sanctions have not managed to sink the Russian economy. Perhaps it wasn't their goal either. It may not be anyone's interest to create massive global chaos and drive the Kremlin so mad that they risk the nuclear code case being opened. In fact, little by little, the sanctions seem to have been increasingly aimed at the second mission, limiting the potential of the Russian economy in the long term. Be that as it may, if one thing is clear, it is that the other objective, the first objective just mentioned, is not being fulfilled. Even today, many believe that Russia will be able to control the situation for now, shore up its economy and maintain its war effort. And you know what? Maybe in this case, they're right. Russia's war economy expands more than forecast despite sanctions GDP expanded 4.9% in second quarter, topping most forecasts. Russian GDP growth has come as something of a surprise to international analysts. The northern giant seems to be recovering at full speed. But that's not all. Beyond the first hit of sanctions during the second quarter of 2022, Russia's GDP has just kept growing. The Russian economy is even at full employment. And of course, with such figures, the conclusions seem clear, don't they? We could almost say that the Russian bear is going gangbusters. Nevertheless, let's not go too fast because things are never that simple. Many people fear that Russia may take advantage of this spectacular economic growth to rearm and take the Ukrainian war into a new phase. But let us say right now that there is every reason to to believe that this will not be the case. Therefore, what is behind the positive figures we are seeing in the Russian economy? Will Putin be able to use this economic boom to boost his role in the war? Well, today on Visual Economic, we tell you all about it. So let's get into it. A moment ago, we told you about the historic sanctions that the West has imposed on Russia. If you are a loyal follower of Visual Economic, you may remember a video we uploaded almost a year ago, in which we explained them in detail. But allow us to do a brief recap. Basically, we can categorize sanctions into three types. On the one hand, Ukraine's allies established controls on the products that Russia can export and import. The aim of these sanctions was to prevent Putin from obtaining mainly microchips and other technological products with which to manufacture all kinds of weapons. In addition, and as you all know, the Kremlin's main source of income is oil, and to a lesser extent, gas. So Europe's number one objective was to reduce its dependence on Russian gas, which accounted for 40% of the supply, but we will tell you more about this later. The second type of sanctions consisted of blocking Moscow's finances. Assets such as money held by Russia in other countries were frozen, and the country was also expelled from the swift international transaction system, so that it could not easily trade with the rest of the world. Finally, sanctions were also approved, specifically targeting Russian oligarchs. Basically, they sought to freeze the foreign accounts of all these people, although some countries went further and even banned their entry. Well, as we told you in that video, these sanctions did much more damage than it seemed at first sight. Consumption plummeted, oil and gas revenues fell sharply, and the Kremlin was forced to control capital flows between the country and abroad so that the ruble would not collapse. Be that as it may, the fact is that a few months have already passed since all of that, and many experts point out that the effect of these sanctions could have been considerably diluted. In other words, Russia may have adapted to living with them. The question is, how did they do it? Well, mainly through two fundamental mechanisms. Take a look.
As we have said, sanctions on Russian oil and gas severely restricted the purchase of the same from Western countries. And so, in the first instance, Russia lost its largest customers. However, as you know, as the law is made, so are the loopholes. And although Germany, for instance, cannot buy oil directly from Russia, what it can do is to buy it from India, while India in turn buys it from Russia. Borrell calls for a halt to the purchase of fuels from India that come from Russian oil. If diesel or gasoline enters Europe, coming from India and produced with Russian oil, that is certainly a circumvention of sanctions and member states should take action, the bloc's diplomatic chief said in an interview with the Financial Times. In exchange for a commission, countries such as India, China, or even the United Arab Emirates are responsible for selling these Russian fuels to Europe, which in theory should be banned. Obviously, Russia receives less money for this. But in any case, thanks to mechanisms like this, Putin's country is still exporting more or less the same gas and oil today as it did before the war. And worst of all, this is not even the only way Russia is circumventing Western sanctions. There is more. Remember we told you that one of the main sanctions was to expel Russia from the SWIFT system to make it more difficult to make payments to other countries? Well, pay close attention to this news. Russia's VTB launches transactions in Chinese Yuan bypassing the SWIFT system. Sanctions have increased the use of Russia's SWIFT alternative, the System for Transfer of Financial Messages, SPFS, which was developed by Russia's central bank. Exactly. On the one hand, what Russia has done is very simple. If they cannot use the SWIFT system, they simply need need other countries, such as China, to do it for them. In fact, Yuan imports have gone from less than 5% in early 2022 to one third today. And if that were not enough, Russia has already launched a new interbank program similar to SWIFT. And yes, it is true that the objective of the sanctions was never to crush the Russian economy. And unlike on other occasions, this time the West has focused much more on applying strategic sanctions targeting specific sectors. But even so, it seems that Russia has managed to evade international sanctions without being too bad badly affected, which would explain the huge increase in its GDP, right? Well, wait a minute, because if you know us, you know what we're going to say. Things are never as straightforward as they seem. What's more, what would you think if I told you that Russia's economic recovery could all just be smoke and mirrors? Yeah, just as I said, Russia may not be as well off as it pretends to be. Do you want to know why? Well, pay attention. The war is in the details. First of all, one thing is obvious. If Russia is doing so well, why has most of its data not been published for over a year? In other words, the Russian government has been systematically withholding almost all information about its economy for months. A bit odd, don't you think? And although the data are rather opaque, we can still get a good idea of what is behind the growth of Russian GDP. And no, we are not saying that this data is false, but that its interpretation is somewhat different from the one we are usually given. Pay close attention to the following graph. In this graph, we can see what Russia is producing right now, what its economy is dedicated to. As you can see, the manufacture of such important products as household appliances or automobiles has plummeted, registering drops of up to 70%. In fact, excluding household appliances, all other categories are far, far below production levels at the height of the pandemic. And yes, I know what many of you are thinking, but what do I care about appliances or cars? If Russia is growing, it is simply because there must be sectors that have grown even more to compensate for this decline. And you know what? You are absolutely right. However, the important thing is to see precisely which sectors are taking off. You see, the thing is that if we look at where the Russian economy is growing, what we find is that it is not growing in gas or oil, but in the manufacture of optical and electronic products, metallurgical products and aircraft. That is, in the manufacture of military equipment and supplies. Russia's growth is because it is producing like crazy. True, but virtually all of its production is focused on war. As you all know, economists often use a country's GDP to measure its wealth and quality of life because its correlation with other indicators is very strong. Thus, a high GDP means that the society is producing goods and services that are highly appreciated by the general public. However, this is not always the case, and the case of Russia is crystal clear. Currently, Putin's regime is producing many things that do not grant any material welfare to ordinary Russians, nor does it provide him with wealth to buy other things. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Remember we told you 
argue that the Russian economy is at full employment, that companies are scrambling to hire workers. Well, once again, in a normal economy, this would be great news. But in the Russia of 2023, such low unemployment is essentially because a significant chunk of its working age population has left the country or is shooting guns in the war. And another significant chunk are working in some munitions factory or building tanks. That is, they are not producing goods that the rest of the citizens want to buy. To put it another way, if tomorrow Putin enlisted all the Russians in the military, yes, they would have full employment and they could count all that workers' GDP as they pleased. But no one in the country would have a single piece of bread to put in their mouths. But guess what? There's even more to this story. Listen up. The war snowball. We have just seen that Russia's growth has nothing to do with the growth of the economy, and that, in its case, GDP, is a very inaccurate gauge. But there is more. The truth is that even if all this economic growth were real, things are still not looking very good for Moscow. Yes, the Russian economy may be growing, but the cost of the war is getting higher and higher. Notice in this graph, you are looking at the Russian government's deficit, its public revenues minus expenditures. And what is happening is that the war is costing more and more money, is more and more loss-making, and it's creating a huge financial hole in Russia's public accounts. And frankly, the latter should not come as much of a surprise. The way the war has progressed, it is exactly what we can expect. Remember that Putin planned a kind of blitzkrieg. He intended to take Kyiv in a couple of days at most. However, he has ended up with a large number of Russians entrenched for months. All those Russians need food, ammunition, medical care, and in short, all the expenses associated with the war. If we add to all this that Ukraine is doing a great job attacking supply warehouses and transport routes, then it makes total sense that Russia is finding it increasingly difficult to maintain its troops. But do you want another example? The first months of 2023, Ukraine was destroying around four to five Russian artillery pieces per day. But since about May, this figure has skyrocketed, multiplying on average by more than five. What's more, according to the Kremlin media, Russia is reportedly manufacturing thousands of state-of-the-art tanks almost every day. But if we look at the battlefield, the reality seems to be somewhat different. Russia sent 70-year-old T-55 tanks to Ukraine without even upgrading them. Before we know it, the Russian army will have to take out the display tanks from the Second World War museums. And well, remember how the ruble came out stronger after the first wave of sanctions? Well, as you can see in this graph, since the initial upturn, it has not stopped falling, despite the strict capital controls that Putin's regime has imposed on its population, and the war spending hole has its consequences. By now, it should be clear that it is not that the Russian economy is not at the service of the ordinary Russian, but that the growth in the military sector will not even allow Putin to launch a new offensive with the best equipment available, but rather that, to a large extent, military spending only serves to maintain the current effort to try to resist the Ukraine Ukrainian onslaught and little else. And although yes, I know what many of you will be thinking, okay, the growth of the Russian economy is not going to allow him to make a major new offensive right now, but what will happen when winter comes and Putin lines his pockets again with gas and oil money? Well, the truth is that there doesn't seem to be very good news for the Moscow regime here either. As you all know, Russia's plan last year was to blackmail the West. Basically, they were saying that we would either buy gas from them or we would freeze to death in the winter. But the truth is that none of that happened. On the one hand, Europe simply bought gas from other suppliers. It cost a lot more than usual, but no one froze to death. On top of that, we had a particularly warm winter, the second warmest since records have been kept. But what will happen if we don't have such a good winter again? Well, no one knows for sure, but this year we are even better prepared than in 2022. On the one hand, gas reserves are almost 100%. And yes, it is true that these reserves are not large enough to feed all the heating systems and factories in Europe for three months. But also the capacity to process liquefied natural gas, which comes to us from the USA, for example, has skyrocketed. Until a year ago, countries such as Germany simply could not treat liquefied natural gas because they had no plants, which was to be expected since they had more than enough Russian gas. But this has changed in record speed. It has gone from having no plants at all to having six fully operational ones. 
The fact is that everything indicates that Putin is not going to have an easy time of redoubling his bet in Ukraine, and that all the new items he is announcing are more focused on maintaining what they already have than on manufacturing weapons as sophisticated as the ones we can see in the West. Be that as it may, and at this point, it is now your turn. Do you really think that the Russian GDP growth implies growth in the real economy? Will we see Russia reduce its deficit? Or, on the contrary, will the cost of the war continue to increase more and more? Will Putin's betting on winter back fire again. You can leave me your answers in the comments. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Economic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell to not miss any of our updates. If you like this video, go ahead and like it, and I'll see you in the next one. All the best. See you next time.